Legend of Zelda and Mario 64 were sharing game assets. There's entire unused stages we've never heard of just sitting in the game files? Yoshi actually jumps to their demise after you talk with them at the end? The answers to these questions and more, right here in this video. If you haven't seen part 1 of the Mario 64 Iceberg Explained, then you should probably start there. It should be linked in the top corner of the video now. If you have seen part 1 and you're ready to explore the third layer of the iceberg, then strap in as we take Bowser's sub down another level into the darkness. Zelda 64 Beta Assets in WDW refers to the small town in Wet Dry World accessible by the player only after altering the water levels on the map and traversing to the cannon. In this town, there are assets such as doors and buildings which very, very closely resemble those found in Zelda 64, which you might know better as The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. The idea is that both development teams probably worked closely enough that they might have shared some assets, easing up strain on one or both teams' workloads. Of note here is that I've read that Metal Mario's texture was taken straight from a Link texture in Legend of Zelda, which may have been referencing the Dark Link texture in Ocarina of Time. WDW Skybox is another secret surrounding Wet Dry World. Get used to it because there's a few of them here on this iceberg. People really don't like the vibe of Wet Dry World. This mystery revolved around the eerie image of an almost realistic looking town being used as a skybox for the world. Anywhere you go in the world where the sky is visible, you can see that image in the distance every time you look up. Turns out, this was an image of a real town. Mario enters WDW early in the Got Milk commercial is what is listed on the iceberg, but as far as anyone can tell, the Got Milk commercial shows a player with 37 stars in Wet Dry World. No mystery there, since it only requires 31 total stars to get there without glitches. Maybe the iceberg's creator experienced a Mandela effect with the commercial? Cold Cold Crevasse is actually in the original Mario 64 game. Yes, finally. An unheard of secret stage from the iceberg that's actually real. Oh. Oh, what's that? It's just mentioned on a sign in Cool Cool Mountain. There's not actually any Cold Cold Crevasse stage in the game. Don't tell that to the internet, though, because apparently this stage is popularly recounted as one of the stages from personalized copies of Mario 64. Did we really need another snow stage, though? Womp's Fortress Interior is the idea that one can enter the fortress through the tower that appears atop the island. Some players have claimed that their copies of the game have a door on this tower that allows them to go inside to another part of the world expanding Womp's Fortress immensely. This concept probably arises because the stage has fortress in the name, but we never enter any fortress during the level. Chances are, the island is just the fortress that was mentioned, but in the debug menu, later shown in the video, the stage was just called Mountain as a Whole. LLL Painting Fireball refers to the fireball face on the Lethal Lava Land painting. At first glance, it makes sense, as it is a fire-based stage. But if you think about it, all the other paintings feature an image of the world they lead to. If there's any paintings at all, this painting just shows a fireball. And the fireballs don't even appear in this Mario title. It reminds me a lot of the Bowser face that appears in the screen when you die as well. How Bowser got into the castle with this sub refers to the idea that Bowser infiltrated Peach's castle by entering through an open port that can be found in Dire Dire Docks, where the sub now rests. This port does lead to the castle ground, so there is some relevance to this theory. I never really questioned how the sub got into Dire Dire Docks, because that big hole in the side of the level that was also underwater kind of gave it away for me. Real question though, how did that ship get into Dolly Roger Bay, hmm? Big Boo's Haunt Forest refers to a stage from personalized copies of the game known as Big Boo's Forest. The idea likely stems from the spooky moonlit woods in the skybox of Big Boo's Haunt, which seems like an excellent idea for a stage, though I've never seen it. Big Boo's Secret Laugh is a somewhat ominous laugh that plays by random chance and can be heard anywhere on the stage. It's probably here because it only plays randomly, and people don't usually pay attention to those background sounds. Haunted Dirt Texture is the idea that the dirt texture in the game has a creepy face in it. There's not much here if you ask me. It's a common phenomenon known as pareidolia, in which people tend to perceive meaningful images in random patterns. The end screen refers to the final image that displays after beating the game and the credits have rolled. There's a weird shape behind the cake in the foreground, and vague shapes are supposedly visible in the corners of the background. Again, probably just some pareidolia, but who knows? The shape behind the cake really does look a bit like Yoshi's face from the front. 
Debug menu names refers to the names of stages that can be chosen from the debug menu's level selection. This wouldn't be particularly interesting on its own, but these level names are not what you'd expect. I guess the developers forgot to change out these names in the debug menu because, honestly, what gamer really even knew it existed back when it was released, so what was the worry? Here are some of the more interesting development names for stages. WTGG and Tinboutu, which apparently stands for Water Dungeon and Submission for Jolly Roger Bay, Horror Dungeon for Hazy Maze Cave, EXT1 Yoko Scroll or Extra 1 Side Scroller for Bowser in the Dark World, EXT3 Heaven or Extra 3 Heaven for Bowser in the Sky, and Just Mountain for Womp's Fortress. Oh yeah, and can't forget Donkey and Slide 2 for Tall Tall Mountain. There's plenty of empty slots in the debug menu as well, as there were clearly more levels being planned, even late into Super Mario 64's development. 120 has spiritual significance is apparently a reference to angel numbers, which have, as the name of the secret implies, spiritual significance to some people. Who knows? Mario is Freemason initiation is exactly what it implies, in that Super Mario 64 was meant to get kids ready to be initiated into the Freemason someday, apparently. I doubt very much that this was the case, but that hasn't stopped people from making the connections. From the castle's Freemason-style designs to the coins which feature five-pointed stars that could be strewed somewhat as pentacles, which apparently have been tied to Freemason imagery. Honestly, I don't think Mara's a Freemason chill. Sorry, conspiracy nuts. Yoshi ends it all. The actual name of the secret, as listed on the iceberg, would get this video spanked by YouTube, so I'll just say it like that refers to something Yoshi does after you talk to them after collecting 120 stars. Yoshi turns around, runs towards the edge of the castle roof, and jumps off. Uh, yeah, that kind of sounds bad, but the reality is that Yoshi can survive much greater heights than Mario and many other characters can, so Yoshi probably just jumped off and scampered on back to their island or something. Skyboxes are photographs is the idea that the skybox images are photographs of real world places. Probably not, but hey, I've heard weirder. Original resolution textures is the idea that there are higher quality original renders of the textures from Super Mario 64 since all we have now are the lower resolution versions from the game. It would be pretty neat to see some higher resolution textures from Mario 64, but with all the work put in by ROM hacks and the like these days, I don't really think it's necessary now. Maybe interesting for gaming history. Islands in the distance refers to some small islands that can be spotted in the horizon of the skyboxes of bob on Battlefield and Tiny Huge Island. It's a neat little detail to spot, but there's not much here that's worthy of note, except that some players believe personalized copies of the game allow you to visit these islands in another stage. Rainbow Rides Village is a supposed area in personalized copies of the game that appears in Rainbow Ride. Only thing is, this village actually did appear in Super Smash Bros. Melee, which is why some people may think it's in Super Mario 64 too. Bob Bomb Village is another village area from personalized copies of the game, and this one is often inexorably tied to a beta image of a brown hill, atop which a sombrero man stands with three Bob Bombs around him, which is probably what inspired the idea in the first place. Secret Slide Dimensional Rift refers to the voids in which the slide levels appear to be placed. People have theorized this is a rift in space, existing between dimensions where only slides can be found. I don't know. It's a cool idea, I guess. I like it. The slide dimension. Tower of the Wing Cap True Location refers to where the Red Cap Switch stage is actually located in the Mario world. Nothing can be seen below the clouds at the bottom of the stage, so for now, it's anyone's guess. True Locations of Painting Worlds relates to the Tower of the Wing Cap's true location I just talked about, in that the stages depicted in the paintings appear to be actual places in the Mario world. The strongest indicator of this is that Dire Dire Docks leads directly to the castle grounds, which is also the method by which Bowser is theorized to have entered the castle, as mentioned earlier. So where are the other stages located? Something to think about. I saw a cool video that I'll link in the description where someone prototyped a version of Super Mario 64 with the stages actually in the same open world as the castle, and I think it's a pretty neat idea. Removed courses refers to unused or otherwise completely removed courses that Miyamoto and the team intended for Super Mario 64 to ship with. Some of these courses that were in the game but not utilized were 2 Test, 32 Night, 35 Poison, and 3 Kinop, as well as a blank stage called Moto's Factory which was likely a testing ground for the Moto's enemy which ultimately also went unused. Miyamoto and the team 
I initially wanted there to be double the number of stages roughly that were implemented in the final cut of the game, but deadlines and hardware forced expectations to be dropped before release, leaving us to wonder what else the team had up their sleeves, and what a fully fleshed out Mario 64 would have looked like. And that covers the third layer of the Super Mario 64 iceberg, and we can start to see the topic slowly get darker. In our last video, we dove below the surface of the waters of Mario 64, and now we've made it down the iceberg a bit. Stretching out underneath us now is the black abyss of levels 4 and 5. In the next videos, we'll talk about the truly strange and twisted topics that feature down there, such as a curse on the game from a company that worked on the Nintendo 64, and shared nightmares stemming from playing that very game. All of that, and much more, lurking in the iceberg's darkest layers. If you want to dive deeper into the Super Mario 64 iceberg and hear more about corporate curses, shared game nightmares, and so, so much more, then check out part 3 linked here now on the end screen. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a quick like and subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.